I have a strange story for you. In prison, Richard Speck caught a sparrow, tied a string around its leg, and turned it into a pet. And when a guard told him he had to let it go, he threw it into a fan and the bird suffered a sickening and terrible death. When the shocked guard asked him why he did it, he said, if it ain't mine, it ain't nobody's. That's the same attitude he had about women. You know, when most people hear the word mass murder, they usually think of domestic terrorism and school shootings. However, this wasn't always the case. Mass murder wasn't something that was in our vocabulary until Richard Speck murdered eight student nurses in one night in Chicago. And you won't believe how he ended up. Let's get into this. Good to see you. I'm Chris, and this is True Crime Recaps. Every week, my wife Amy and I are here bringing you all the crime in half the time. If that sounds good to you, I hope you'll give this a like and hit subscribe so you never miss a recap. Now, back to Richard Speck, a bargain basement James Dean wannabe with a drinking problem and a lifetime of rage issues that culminated in a four-hour killing spree on July 13th, 1966. Richard spent that day drinking and feeling sorry for himself. He'd been trying to get work as a merchant marine for the past five days with no luck. He'd lost one job to a sailor with more seniority, another job turned out to be filled already, and just that morning he came up empty again at the union hiring hall. The building was only about a block away from the townhouses where the student nurses from South Chicago Community Hospital stayed. While he was at the bar, he picked up a woman and took her back to his room at the shipyard inn where he raped her at knife point and stole her gun. Then he went back to his seat at the bar and kept drinking, but he didn't stay there long. By 11 that night, armed with a knife and a stolen gun, he was standing in front of one of the dorms near the Union Hall, knowing full well what he was about to do inside. He broke in, climbed the stairs, and knocked four times on the first door he came to. The woman who opened it was Corazon Amaro. She was a 23-year-old nursing exchange student from the Philippines. Richard's knocking had gotten her out of bed in the room she shared with another Filipino nursing exchange student, Merlita Gargulo. The two women had spent the evening washing clothes and writing letters home before turning in early. All of a sudden, they found themselves staring down the barrel of a gun held by a blank-faced stranger. Richard forced them into another bedroom down the hall where three more student nurses, Pamela Lee Wilkening, Patricia Ann Matusek, and Valentina Passion, were sleeping. Corazon, Merlita, and Valentina were all grad students from the Philippines. The other girls in the house were finishing their last year of nursing school. None of them were older than 24. In the bedroom, the three Filipino nurses ran for the closet and held the door closed behind them. They came out after the other girls convinced them that Richard wasn't there to hurt anyone. He, he said he just wanted money to travel to New Orleans. By this time, he'd woken up Nina Jo Schmael and forced her into the room with them as well. As he was collecting their purses and pocketing their cash, another housemate, Gloria Jean Davy, came home. Gloria had been out with her fiancé and his mother, enjoying a fancy dinner of steak and champagne to celebrate the older woman's release from the hospital. She found herself in the middle of a nightmare only moments after her boyfriend dropped her off and pulled away. Richard forced her onto the bed at gunpoint and bound her hands and feet together with pieces of their sheets. When all seven women were tied up, he pointed at Pamela, untied her ankles, and led her out of the room. While he was gone, two more housemates came home. Mary Ann Jordan and Suzanne Ferris had been out at Burger King with another housemate, Pat Waddington. According to the Chicago Sun-Times, Suzanne was engaged to Mary Ann's brother, so most of the night was spent talking about wedding plans and discussing an issue the three of them were having with one of their instructors. When 12.30 a.m. rolled around, Mary Ann and Suzanne left for home, but something made Pat stay the night next door. And just minutes after the two women walked inside, Richard was on top of them, stabbing them to death. Then he returned to the bedroom and took Nina back out the door with him. As each girl was led out of the room never to return, it quickly became clear that this stranger was taking more than their money. The other girls tried to hide, but he dragged them out one by one. Finally, it came down to Gloria and Corazon. Gloria was tied to the bed so she couldn't move, and Corazon was face down on her stomach hiding under a bed across the room one with a blanket hanging over the side. From her hiding place, she was forced to listen to her friend's muffled screams coming from the rooms on the other side of the bedroom door. 
All except Gloria were gone. Richard raped her on the bed, then dragged her to the living room where he stabbed her to death on the couch. When he got back to the bedroom, Corazon thought for sure she was next. She lay there, trying to hold her breath, waiting for him to grab a leg or an arm and drag her out from under the bed. But it never happened. He had butchered eight of her friends in under four hours, and in his frenzy, he forgot about her. She lay there, terrified for hours before she was sure he was gone. And when the alarm clock went off at 5 a.m., then again at 5.30, she crawled out from under her hiding place, opened the door, and saw the blood and the bodies all over the house. The women had all been stabbed or strangled or both. In a panic, she made her way out onto the window ledge and screamed, Help! Help! They're all dead! Corazon was the only survivor. Luckily, she got a good look at his face and the very distinctive tattoo on his forearm. It said, Born to Raise Hell. Every cop in the city got a description of the killer and his ink. The police sketch was sent to newspapers around the country just in case he'd left the city. Richard was the most wanted man in America, but he hadn't left Chicago. From the crime scene, he went to a bar on the other side of town and kept drinking. But the news about the murdered nurses followed him there. The bartender remembered him speculating out loud that a sex maniac had probably done it. Imagine how surprised he must have been to learn that he accidentally left one of the girls alive. And when he saw his own face in a police sketch, he decided he'd be better off drinking alone. He took a room under a fake name at a seedy place on Skid Row called the Star Hotel. After a couple of days of hard drinking, he decided that his only escape was suicide. So he slashed his wrist and forearm with broken glass and laid down to die. But at the last minute, he changed his mind, and someone else saw him in the bleeding in the hall and called down to the front desk for an ambulance. At age 24, Richard Speck was nothing more than a drifter with a ninth grade education and a criminal resume filled with dozens of convictions for things like forgery, theft, and disorderly conduct. He was born in Kirkwood, Illinois on the day before the attack on Pearl Harbor brought the United States into World War II. He was the seventh of eight kids in a large religious family. His father died when he was six. Three years later, his mother remarried a drunken, abusive asshole of an insurance salesman, and the family moved to Dallas, Texas. Richard hated him, but by the time he was 15, he had pretty much become him. He was already a full-blown alcoholic, and he dropped out of school. In November 1962, when he was 21, he met 15-year-old Shirley Malone at the Texas State Fair. Three weeks later, she was pregnant with his child, and the two of them got married a couple of months later. Their daughter, Bobby Lynn, was born soon after, but as you might have guessed, being a husband and a father didn't agree with him. When he wasn't beating on Shirley, he was assaulting strangers, usually after a drunken binge. He spent most of their short-lived marriage behind bars. When his wife finally took their baby girl and left him in 1966, he made his way to Monmouth, Illinois. He had an older brother living there, working in construction. He tried to help Richard out by teaching him the trade and putting him on work crews, but he always found a way to screw it up. Then, in April 1966, two local women were attacked. One ended up beaten to death. Her name was Mary Kay Pierce. She worked behind the bar at his favorite tavern, and there wasn't any evidence connecting him to her, and he was never formally charged with her death. When the cops came around to ask him about it, he was already gone. But he left behind some personal possessions, tying him to the rape and robbery of another woman, 65-year-old Miss Virgil Harris. She was another victim he never had to answer for. He fled to Chicago, where his sister was living, and it was her husband who suggested that he get work as a merchant marine. And by the end of April 1966, he was sailing away on a ship. But his new career didn't last long. Three days later, his appendix was about to burst, and he was evacuated for emergency surgery in Michigan. Ironically, he started dating one of his nurses, and she actually floated him some cash to tide him over while he looked for a crew position on another ship. As the emergency room doctor was stitching him up on July 16th, he thought Richard looked familiar. The doctor was fresh off his dinner break where he had been reading all about the horrific murders. The article included Corazon's description of the killer along with details about his tattoo. The same born-to-raise-hell tattoo that was slowly emerging from underneath the blood on his patient's arm. 
For more than a week, Richard was kept in his hospital bed under armed guard. At some point, Corazon was brought to his window where she identified him as the man who murdered eight of her friends. Between her testimony and the hundreds of fingerprints he left in the townhouse, it was an open and shut case. After a 12-day trial, it took the jury less than an hour to sentence him to death, and that should have been the end of Richard Speck. But it was far from it. He wasn't quite done raising hell just yet. He spent less than five years on death row before the Supreme Court outlawed capital punishment, and his sentence was commuted to 1,200 years in prison, 50 to 150 years for each nurse. Notorious inmates like Richard are popular targets for other inmates, and with his long criminal history, he knew that better than anyone. So, he came up with a bizarre plan to ensure his safety. He started taking female hormones, not because he felt like a woman trapped in a man's body. No, by all accounts, he was transitioning so he could survive prison. When he was first locked up, he had to be kept in solitary for his own protection, but by the time he died in 1991, he was the most popular girl there. The whole sordid story came to the public's attention in 1996. That's when a video was leaked to a Chicago TV station showing the notorious killer snorting cocaine and having sex with male inmates. A group of inmates shot the sex tape in 1988 over the course of two days using AV equipment meant for staff training. The guards must not have been paying attention on the day they were taught not to let the prisoners do whatever they wanted. After all, there was Richard Speck, one of the country's most heinous killers, half-naked, wearing women's silk underwear, bragging about the murders on camera. He talked about how hard it was to strangle people, saying it wasn't like TV. It takes over three minutes and you have to have a lot of strength. He admitted that, yes, he did remember killing the nurses, even though at his trial he claimed he did it in a drunken fog. But after they were all dead, he said he didn't feel any which way about it, and he wasn't sorry about it. When he was asked why he chose them, he simply shrugged and said, It just wasn't their night. He claimed to love being a sex object in prison, telling the man behind the camera, If they only knew how much fun I was having here, they would turn me loose. According to his prison psychiatrist, transitioning to a female form was Richard's way of punishing himself for all the terrible things he had done to women he came in contact with. Putting himself into the position of being raped and degraded was his way of apologizing. But I don't know about that. Richard always had a way of escaping justice, at least until he was finally caught in Chicago. And maybe this was just another way for him to escape the violent fate waiting for him in prison. And it worked. He died of a heart attack the day before he turned 50. His family refused to claim his body, so he was cremated, and his ashes were buried in an unmarked grave near the prison. As for Corazon Amaro, the only survivor of the July 13th massacre, she returned to the Philippines and married a lawyer and had kids. Eventually, she and her family moved back to the U.S., and she took a job as a nurse at Georgetown University Hospital in Washington, D.C., where she worked until she retired. And that's your recap. I want to thank you again for spending some time with me today. Amy and I are here every week. So until next time, take care.